an assistant teacher in the integrated social sciences program at the Jackson School. She received her PhD in 2019 from Cornell. She specializes in environmental sociology and Southeast Asian studies. She worked as the associate director of, of the American Institute for Indonesian Studies and as the managing director of the Southeast Asia program at UW from 2017 to 2018. And I'm very excited to have her here with us. She took the drive down um, and she brought her son with her. We always love when that happens. In fact, last year when we had, we had a UW teacher who came down to talk about Taiwan, also came down with his very young son who was about six months old. So um, anyway, big hand for, um, for Professor Menarchik and um, remember to think about your questions. And when we get to the questions, ask a question and it shall be 30 seconds or less and it'll have a question mark at the end. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. I'm really excited to, um, I was be down here. Um, thank you to everyone who's also joining via Zoom. Uh, my specialty actually is in online education. So I teach primarily online asynchronous content. So it's a lot of not seeing people in person. So this is a real treat. Um, and also thank you again to uh, my son for making the drive with me. Uh, he has been going back and forth to Indonesia almost as long as I have. He started in uh, when he was two months old going to Indonesia. So if you have any questions uh, or something, if I'm incapacitated, you can just have him finish the talk for me. But um, I am an environmental sociologist, as Tim said, um, and I specialize in natural resources and especially food systems. Um, he kind of talked about some of my stuff, so I won't repeat any of that, but I do specialize in Southeast Asian studies um, within this. However, um, I'm a... I'm very much influenced by my surroundings. Um, I tie in my interest. I tie in um, what my environment, where I'm living. And so right now I actually live in Port Townsend up in the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, and my current project that I'm working on is not taking place in Indonesia. It's a little bit of a stretch for me. I'm moving into Japan um, studies to do some work on seaweed. And this came about because of doing some cold water dips um, in the Puget Sound with friends and just having seaweed all around and becoming very um, excited about this whole ecosystem of seaweed. So that's a new study abroad program that I'm starting um, this summer, actually. We're, we, we're just um, talking about that. We're going to go to Japan this summer to set all of that up. Uh, another thing that I'm uh, have been doing is um, food systems and foraging. So mushrooms, I teach a class called social mycology at the University of Washington. And that looks at um, mushrooms as kind of a sociological lens to help us understand the world around us. So it's not a mushroom identification course. It's more about understanding foraging and the economics of that, the geography of that, some of the social issues. Um, and so it's a really fun class to teach, uh, especially because a lot of the students in that program come from um, diaspora um, populations in Seattle. And so there's a lot of crossover between um, Southeast Asian refugees that have come over to the Seattle area that do a lot of mushroom foraging um, in the Pacific Northwest. So, but we are gonna turn to Indonesia um, and think about some of the, uh, a little bit of reflecting on the article that um, that you read, right? I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna assume you're good students, you read the article, <laughs> we'll go from that, we'll do a little bit of review. Um, and, but really I wanna, I want to use my expertise as a sociologist to help us understand the nation state building process within Indonesia um, and how that is uniquely situated Indonesia in the world, but also in their relationship with, with us here in the United States uh, and even with relationships within its own population. I think it's really easy to look at and think about Indonesia and just assume this like very homogenized population of Indonesians, um, because we aren't, uh, it's not on our radar so much here in the United States. And that is um, very, very much not true. And I hope by the end of this presentation, you will agree with me that that is very, very much not true. So I started going to Indonesia. Um, I've also done work in Thailand and Malaysia, some in Singapore. 
Um, but going to Indonesia in 2007 to look at natural resources, uh, agricultural systems, marginalized populations, and environmental justice. And so this talk really draws on a lot of that work that I did with marginalized populations within Indonesia and their access to natural resources. And so I was looking at how indigenous communities um, have access or are denied access to much needed natural resources. And so looking at that history of indigeneity within Indonesia is really what I'm drawing on from um, for this talk. The starting premise um, that when Tim contacted me, uh, his, oops, my buttons are at different sides. Um, when Tim contacted me and um, started saying, you know, here's the premise for the talk, why is Indonesia under the radar? Um, and we start seeing some of these facts. It's very, very hard to imagine that a country like this can fly under the radar, right? This is the most populous country in Southeast Asia. It's the fourth most populous country in the entire world. It's an island nation with over 17,500 islands, a thousand different ethnic groups, over, over 600 different languages. It's also, and this is a big one too, the world's most populous Muslim country. That's huge and that, I mean, that's a very important reason why Indonesia should not be flying under the radar for us here in the United States. It's also rich in natural resources, and this is what drew me to Indonesia in the first place. A lot of these um, are very extractive industries. It's a lot of mining. It's a lot of um, timber. It's also a lot of plantation agriculture, um, so very extractive industries. And that also, these natural resources really color Indonesia's um, colonial history, as you'll see. We kind of go through the, the presentation. So. With all this in mind, how has it flown under the radar? How has it flown under the radar? And I'm going to say my view on it, I have two, two views. It has flown somewhat under the radar because of this really complex colonial history and state building project that was really very all encompassing for the country. It took a lot of time and energy, as you'll see, and as you read in the article. But then I'm also going to say at the exact same time, it has not flown under the radar. It has not at all. It is very much tied into world systems throughout to other governments. And maybe if populations aren't aware of the importance of Indonesia, government leaders are not um, unaware of its importance within the world system. And Indonesia has been the center of many um, tangled webs with world leaders throughout history. For example, um, it, Indonesia has been the subject of 300 years of colonial occupation by the Dutch. And so it was a very much a non-settler colonialism. They came in, um, they were interested in these natural resources that was extractive, they took what they needed. Um, and it was a system that once World War II started and they realized they were spread too thin that they kind of started to pull back out of Indonesia. And that is when um, the Japanese came into Indonesia. And the president at the time, Sukarno, um, actually, I'm sorry, not the president at the time, uh, revolutionary who would become the president, um, partnered with the Japanese. And in his mind, he saw um, someone like him, someone, another Asian, and he thought, this is going to be great. This is going to free us from Dutch colonial rule. And he was very, 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 very right and very, very wrong. Um, the Japanese occupation of Indonesia was during the war years of 1942 to 1945. And the Japanese came in and they needed resources for the war machine. So again, rich in natural resources, they needed those resources. It was a extractive industry for them. It was a slash and burn just take it all down. Um, and so it was uh, a very violent 
occupation, uh, both to people and to the environment when the Japanese were there. But at the same time, Sukarno was able to work with the Japanese in order to broker a, a peace or a independence for the country. And so the Japanese, they they honestly didn't really care about Indonesia's independence. They didn't care whether it was colonial Dutch. They didn't care whether it was own thing. They just wanted and needed resources. And so they were fine with saying, okay, let's figure out an independence deal, but you got to work with us afterwards, right? And so there was, there was all these like processes that were happening, definitely. Um, and Indonesia was very much at the center of it. It was not flying under the radar. After um, World War II, Japanese surrender, the, um, the actually the Indonesian um, people were aided by the Dutch in order to maintain that independence after World War II to kick the Japanese out. Um, and the Dutch were like, well, we're back and why we're here? Why don't, why don't we just take back over? Um, and the Indonesians were like, no, we're not, we're, no, we're not, we're not having that. But it took four years, four years of fighting um, and pretty brutal fights across the entire country in order to finally um, agree for the Netherlands to transfer sovereignty to Indonesia. So as you can see, there's a lot going on. It's a very all-encompassing project for Indonesian leaders, but at the same time, it's very much at the center of everything that's happening in the world. There's all these political intrigues, these, there's all these connections that are happening. And so that brings me to this the, the main part or point of really what I want to talk today about is the nation state building as a sociological experiment. How do you take 1,700, 500 islands? Um, sorry, that's over a thousand. That was a, uh, not, yeah, that was an old one. Um, over a thousand ethnicities, 600 languages, and turn it into one unified nation. And I hope that as I go through this history and some of these nuances of what was happening in this, this situation, that you'll start to reflect a little bit on the project of state building here in the United States that we have done, because I think you'll find some very similar things. There's a lot of like, um, a lot of people with um, very different backgrounds, with very different languages, um, coming from different cultures. And how do you pull all those together to create one nation? And so although we have not traditionally really thought of Indonesia as similar to us, it has a different colonial history, um, I think you will see some similarities as we go through this. And so how the question, you know, how does this relate to broader emerging issues across the globe? What kind of issues do we see happening in countries, despite these slightly different backgrounds and histories? And how does it connect to emerging issues that we see happening right now and right here, both in the United States and in Indonesia? And how can we apply these lessons learned to other regions and countries? And for me, this is so much a part of the sociological process. Like for me, I'm a pattern master. That's that's all I want. I want to understand the world in sense of patterns. And to me, that is the sociological experiment. I want to take recognize patterns and things that are happening around the world. I want to be able to recognize how those patterns emerge, what gave birth to that, and what kind of predictions we can make about the world based on this kind of patterns that we see emerging around um, throughout environmental resources, nation state building, indigeneity. And so that's really where we're going to go with um, this talk. So we have the first um, Indonesian president, Sukarno, and I hope that a majority of this was covered in that 1960, what was that, 1066 talk? 1964. So he was still in power, um, but he was on his way out. Um, like I referred to earlier, um, Sukarno worked with the Japanese. He saw this as a way to gain independence for his his not country at that point, but this territory that he was a part of. He helped to orchestrate Indonesian independence. It was not 
none of this is clean. None of this is easy. This is all, um, every single, I think about the word choice of every single thing that goes up on this slide because did he really orchestrate? Was he behind it? Was he, uh, you know, an actor or was he uh, being pulled into some of this? So all of these words, take them with a grain of salt, but um, there's something happening here. Sukarno was working his magic. He was helping to kind of orchestrate Indonesian independence with um, the Japanese. Uh, and actually, he was kidnapped by a bunch of younger revolutionaries um, when there was the Dutch and the Japanese were kind of coming to a head uh, and they kidnapped him, took him to a radio station and made him proclaim Indonesian independence because he didn't want to. He was a little bit like, it's, it's not the right moment. It's not the right moment. Uh, and so he's sometimes orchestrating things. Sometimes he's um, being acted upon in a lot of these situations. After that de de declaration of independence and that um, this was uh, in the, in, sorry, in 45, um, and it took a while, 45 is when he was officially, or he was, they declared independence, but again, like I said, there was those four years of them fighting against the Dutch in order to have them accept their sovereignty. So there's there's some little bit of like wiggle room on the dates and such in here, but during his presidency, um, one point that was really important is that Sukarno um, worked towards closer ties with communist countries during his presidency. He had close ties with Russia, he had close ties with China, he had close ties with Cuba, and that made people a bit nervous. Some of these other actors in other countries around the globe. Um, that was um, a situation that needed remedying according to the CIA and British intelligence. And so um, he was ousted in a coup d'etat by some of his other generals. Um, and that was due to kind of this outside influence from um, CIA and British intelligence in order to stop this relationship with these communist countries. And we're going to, um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about the ways that unity and diversity works within Indonesia. And one of the main ways that it works within Indonesia is unity and diversity is dividing us by economic means. And that's very much a emphasis on um, the Indonesian Communist Party. So we'll see why that is really important here. Then you have Suharto, who is um, on his way in at the time of our last talk for World Oregon. Um, and he, again, nuances of word choice here, orchestrated at least parts of the 1965 coup d'etat. Um, and so that coup is really difficult to understand because there were so many moving parts to it, so much blame placed on all these different people. But the outcome was, is that Suharto became president of Indonesia in 1968. He had a strong centralized government with close military ties. And part of his place within this story is that he didn't like, obviously, or maybe he just saw it as a way to gain a presidency, who knows, but he didn't care for the close ties that Sukarno was making with these different communist countries. So, he used financing from the CIA and British intelligence in order to orchestrate this coup d'etat. So there was, um, after the coup d'etat in 1965, until about 1968, there was um, an emphasis on placing blame for this coup on the Indonesian Communist Party. They were a very, very easy scapegoat. Um, it was very convenient for Suharto and the generals at this time. So they placed the blame on the PKI, um, which is the Indonesian Communist Party. And from 1965 to 68, there were horrible communist purges within the country. And there's an estimated 500,000 to million people that were killed in this three year period across the country. And so 
there's all of these ties to communism that you can kind of see um, that are trickling down in the state building project where people want Indonesia. It, it's, it's an important country that's, you know, people in these governments are vying for Indonesian kind of power and attention um, throughout all of this. But his presidency and his uh, government was really uh, marked by rampant, rampant uh, corruption. It was a very corrupt um, government, and he was overthrown by student protest in 1998. All right, so I want to get into um, the ways. So we're talking about, and if you read in the article, we're talking about the state building project um, is has a motto in Indonesia. It's called Unity in Diversity. And this particular state building motto is really interesting because it takes these two things that are very different. How do we unify all of these different populations, languages, cultures, and bring them together so that we can unify this nation of pretty arbitrary islands across the, you know, the Indian Ocean and make it into one country, right? It could have been, you could have included this island, you could have left it out. I mean, it's a pretty arbitrary map, right? How do you bring all that together to build um, one country? And importantly, how do you do that without giving those particular groups so much power that they overthrow the current government, right? You want unity, but you also want a little bit of diversity so that they don't get you know, too much political power. And so in Indonesia, there were two streams that this really followed. You have division by culture and ethnicity, and you have a division by economics. I've already talked quite a bit about the division by economics, and that's the communism line. And we're going to go back to that here in a bit and look more at that. But for right now, I want to show you this place. This is called Taman Mini. This is a cultural theme park within Indonesia. And I think, I hope my rooms work. Um, let's give it a tour. So this is the theme park. Oh, it's not done. Why can't you see it? It's not that important. You can. It's just some great pictures of how they view. So, anyways, after the talk, if you're very interested, we can show you um, some of this. But come on, Minnie. was a um, President Suharto and his wife, Ibu Siti, um, conceived of a mini Indonesian park in the early 1970s, and then the park opened in 1975. And it really narrowly defined what it meant to be indigenous in the country. Like I said, unity, but a little bit of diversity too. So it tokenized costumes, buildings, food, highlighted and displayed um, from all of the largest ethnic groups from around Indonesia. And the park is still open. You can still visit. And it's one of the most popular attractions in Jakarta uh, on the island of Java. So if you're in the area and you want to run by <laughs> Taman Mini, you still can. Uh, so it has a pretty lasting and enduring uh, legacy within Indonesia. And it does this through three ways. Thank you. Um, so as you read through the, in the article, there were three Aliran or three um, streams um, of trying to create this unity and diversity. And you have Satu Nusa, which is this one map, right? This is island nation. So over here on the far side, you see the map of Indonesia. You see all of these different island nations, this arbitrary map of what islands are included and what aren't. Then when you look over here, this is the map of Taman Mini. Taman Mini follows the exact same map of Indonesia. It's creating this one map that we can bring together. And whenever you want to go visit, like here, if you want to visit there on the map, it's like here in Taman Mini. So everything is like identical. 
helpful so you can kind of walk around the map of Indonesia. And it's it's kind of this like physical manifestation of this ideal, this is what Indonesia is, right? It's a physical, the park is a physical manifestation of that. You might not recognize him now because he's much taller, but this is my son. <laughs> this is him in Indonesia. And this is the second Aliran, the second way of thinking about unity. And this is Satu Bangsa, this is one people. And so within this, the, yes, there is some recognition of the diversity of people that live and exist within Indonesia. Um, but at the same time, the park also kind of trivializes what that means to be indigenous. So it's like, here are the Batak people. This is what Batak people wear. This is the songs that Batak people sing. This is the food that the Batak people eat. And that's problematic because it doesn't allow any sort of growth or change for communities. And communities have been growing and changing since time immemorial, right? There's what you see even at Taman Mini as this like static idea of what the Batak people is, is very much based in a particular time within history, right? So it, it this Satu Bangsa really stops groups from being able to connect to who they are as a people now, especially um, as some of my research focuses on when they're fighting for land rights. Um, some of those requirements to get those natural resource rights, those land rights, is they have to prove connection, that they never lost those connection to those traditional songs, to those traditional foods. They have to prove that. And so that's like a, and, and it seems very strange to me that there, you have to prove something that you're connected to that might not be relevant to your culture anymore because it's memorialized in a theme park in Java in 1975, right? It's like very complicated. And then the last thing, um, the, the last Aliran, the last stream is Satu Bahasa. And this is one language. And within Taman Mini, they are using, um, so Bahasa Indonesia is not an old language. It's a newer language that was created out of, based on Malay, which is a language of trade. It was also based on Arabic because of Arabic influences within um, Indonesia territories. Uh, it's also based on Dutch. There's a lot of, it pulls from all of these languages, these 600 languages as well. And so it's creating this new language that can unify all these people and all of these territories, and it can welcome them to this park. So everybody welcome, we all have one common language, right? But, and it's also important because um, Bahasa Indonesia, does anyone speak it? It's, there's, it's not hierarchical, right? There's, it's all one. Um, and so it's kind of has this, like it was very purposefully done in this way. A lot of Indonesian languages have hierarchy. So you have, you know, what you would talk to, for example, when I go to my research site, there is a king and a queen and I, we speak Sundanese and there is a particular um, level of Sundanese that I have to speak when I am at the house of the king and the queen. When I'm with friends, it's another level of, right? Well, that doesn't create unity, that creates diversity. So it's very purposely done within Indonesia that this language should not be hierarchical, that they, we should have one in order to unify this country. We already kind of talked a little bit about the PKI. Um, and the PKI was very important in Indonesia from the 1940s to the 1960s. It was a integral part of that state building process. It was a active political party. Um, like I said, Sukarno had close ties with um, the communist party, um, with some of these communist nations. Some of that was also um, 
embellished some of these ties in order to make them a scapegoat. So um, some, are, some are very real ties, but some are also kind of embellished as well. Uh, it has links to the Chinese community and the Chinese party. But importantly, it also has ties to labor organizers. It also has um, ties to uh, women's activists. It has ties. Um, so this is a group called the Gerwani uh, that was within these communist purges. And it's just, a, it's a female organization, right? It also has ties to small uh, land owners. And so small rural farmers that are um, all coming together, all of these groups coming together and saying, we they're organizing based on class. They're organizing based on economics, right? And they're saying, we need land reform because this is not working for us. And so the Indonesian elite, um, as you read in the article, there's not really, yes, it's a new country. Yes, it's new leadership, but it all, it's kind of these political elite that keep kind of coming up again and again. It's the children of these elites. It's the um, son-in-laws of these elites. Um, and so in order to make sure that this economic stream um, was not a way to organize for the Indonesian people is why they became the target then of these communist purges. They were scapegoat for the 1965 um, coup d'etat. They were blamed for that. Uh, and then after the 65 coup d'etat, all the way until 68, there were a um, just these across the country um, communist purges. There's a um, upcoming American Association of Asian Studies that will be hosted in Seattle in March. And the panel I'm, I am on um, is about these communist purges. So if you're in Seattle and you want to go, <laughs> there's a whole panel on it. Um, but then again, 1968 to 1998, this didn't end. These purges didn't stop kind of the persecution of the Chinese community. Um, when you have a lot of economic power centered in the Chinese community, the Indonesian elites don't want to see that become um, a very strong community. And so there are restrictions on language. There's restrictions on education, on culture. And then again, from 1998 to 1999, when you see this overthrow of Suharto, you see him again blaming the Chinese community, the Communist Party, the PKI, what's left of it. Um, and so the Chinese community is, again, the target of riots and looting throughout this time. So we have really two things that are happening. And you can see there is a homogenization of ethnic differences in order to build a state, but also using that to divide people into smaller groups with little political power. So unity and diversity was smooshing down racial and ethnic differences and trapping them in time about what it means to be indigenous, which kind of limits their power up until this day. Class was also too powerful of a unifying ideal. You have the anti-communist purges as an effective tool at silencing class-based arguments that threatened the privileged class in the emerging nation state when their status was the most precarious. So you can see Nation state building is very much walking at the edge of a knife. Over here, you need unity. Over here, you need diversity. Because either way, if you've got too unified of a population, they're going to overthrow you and take power. If you've got them too divided, you can't get them to come together to create one nation, right? So this is a very delicate dance that the Indonesian government is doing throughout this entire time since 1945. And why is this important? And I said we'd come back to this like whole social sociological um, experiment of nation state building. And within Indonesia, you even to this day have some problems with a very homogenized and static idea of indigeneity that still continues to persist. So like I said, there's um, indigenous groups that are fighting for land rights, but in order to prove that, they have to prove ties to these cultural practices that are often kind of outdated for their communities. So Indonesia though, also because it has silenced class-based um, political powers, 
has really been forced to deal with this idea of indigeneity. So they've forced themselves into a corner where they actually do have to talk about what it means to be indigenous. How do we define that? Um, and so they are still currently working on this um, within 2000, about 2012 or so, um, I was doing some field work in Indonesia and they were creating this one map project again, one map, like back to the one map. Um, but they were trying to bring together all of the different mapping agencies within the country uh, and create one map of what it meant. And so all the, these indigenous groups are trying to get on that map to say, we are here, We this is our land claim. And so some of the stuff that they had to, to prove was, you know, connections to like material culture or connection to a particular piece of land. So this is a continuing project for Indonesia, um, and it's, can't, I believe, cannot be ignored any longer. And I believe that it's really going to um, continue to be an issue within Indonesia, especially because you have non-settler colonial history in the country, right? So when the Dutch left, they left a country of Indonesians. It's all of these ethnic groups, but if you really stop to think about it, pretty much anyone in the country could be indigenous or considered indigenous to the country. So it's a really complicated, um, how do you prove indigeneity for these people that have been here, but may have been displaced from their land and their um, cultural practices, right? And then, oh, and, and this, is, um, I, this is on both this slide and the next slide, um, which is my last, because this is something that transcends both the within Indonesia, but also within the international community, is that you have a lot of indigenous groups jumping scale. So they're not working with their, low, or their, their national government to figure out what it means to be indigenous. They have figured out that there are very real tangible rights afforded to indigenous communities. And so they're jumping scale and they're going from the local regional up to international organizations. Um, and so you see that happening not only within Indonesia, um, you see that happening here in the United States as well. And so again, at the bottom, you have this same process um, and just broader implications of it as well is that you can start to see all of these emerging issues that are happening um, within Indonesia, but also here um, with our own nation state building project that in our history. And so maybe Indonesia can actually shed some light on um, what is happening in our country and maybe some emerging issues that we will face um, in the coming decades. So, and that is all I have. Thank you so much. No, I've got a mic. I'm hoping that you have questions. Because I have the mic, I'm gonna ask the first question. And you ended with basically what I was gonna ask about, which is, um, you know, Indonesia has, been a quote-unquote democracy with a level of oftentimes control and authoritarianism. And as people head to the polls, they're, they're heading to the polls next week on Oregon's birthday, it's Valentine's Day. Um, the key issues are both that the role of dynasties <clears throat> and the strength of a country's democracy. And there's a lot of unease that an outgoing president will try and retain influence even after leaving which sounds markedly familiar. Um, and certainly civil society groups are worried about this. Um, is there a strong lesson, especially when we look at the staggering level of diversity in a country, um, is there a lesson to be learned about governance or, non, or, or inability to govern something that is so diverse uh, in this country as we also had toward looking at, oh, dynasties and people trying to retain power. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's all part of this state building project that's really complicated and you want to have a lot of faith in. You want to have, be excited about that. And, and you know, very much for us here as well as in Indonesia. Um, but we're also kind of realistic about what money buys you. Um, and that has bought power for um, many families within Indonesia, both during the Dutch colonial period and even after. Um, and so 
in the article, they talk about Jokowi. Um, Jokowi Widodo is the current president, and he cannot run for a third term. Um, but I think it's his son that is um, too young to run, but there that there's a, a law conveniently passed that now he can run because he held a position of power in solo. And like, so there's all of these things that are happening that you see. It's a little bit discouraging. It's a little bit discouraging for any political system, um, I think here and um, in Indonesia or lessons for other countries as well, um, that there's this kind of continuation of uh, the power of money within politics. Um, I have two, I think, simple factual questions. <laughs> Um, one is, I understand they're moving the capital from Jakarta to somewhere in the jungle. And, you know, they did that in Brazil. I think they tried to do that in Myanmar. And I'm just wondering what is behind that, why they want to do it. Um, and the second thing is, when they formed Indonesia, you talked about the 17,500 islands. Who? How did we decide, who decided, like, this is Indonesia and this is, is Malaysia and this is... We kind of know how that happened in Palestine, in the Levant, but I don't know how it happened in Asia. You know, there's so many of them, too, that I'm sure there's like many different stories of how they came to be included or not included within this map of Indonesia. Um, but the actually, I'll do your first question um, because it all kind of plays together um, that. Jakarta itself was a Dutch colonial project. Jakarta was not this big bustling city before um, the Dutch came in. It was purposely built with there. Um, and so when you go, there's a lot of um, architectural elements that have that, that are very rem reminiscent of like Dutch colonial architecture. Also with like some of the technology with canals and such. The problem is, um, is um, it is sinking very quickly. And so they are losing much of their land within Jakarta um, due to sea level rise, also due to just infrastructure sinking. Um, and so that is what's behind this switch to this capital. But there's also an important part about what your second question is getting at is this like kind of arbitrary linking of different communities. One of the other reasons they are um, proposing the switch is because it is more geographically centered within the country as it is now. And so they are saying that that move over, I think it's Brabajaya, um, is that it will also center politics because right now um, with Jakarta being on the island of Java, there's a very heavy influence of Javanese people within the government of Indonesia. And so I, I think there's this hope that if that's relocated, that they might pull in some more um, of these outer islands that, you know, travel's difficult within Indonesia. Um, and so being able to connect more of those territories around Indonesia into one place. Two short questions. First, could you talk a little more about natural resources? What yes. <laughs> people are so interested in getting today? Maybe it's still nickel, I don't know. And secondly, I'm surprised to read, but it makes every sense that uh, Indonesia supports uh, Palestinian statehood. And I'm wondering if that's unique to Indonesia or could you tell us is, are some of the other countries in Southeast Asia, Myanmar, Cambodia, or Cambodia Thailand, of the same position? I haven't kept up to date on the, the position for countries right now with the current situation, um, but the tie-in with Indonesia is, it, it does make sense, is that it's the largest Muslim population in the world. And so there's that very strong um, familiar like connection to the Palestinian people. Um, within Indonesia, they have traditionally um, in order to get your card, your KTP, um, you have to declare one of the six officially recognized religions. Um, and Islam, or I'm sorry, um, uh, Judaism is not recognized as one of those religions. So there has historically been, you know, no recognition of Judaism as a religion. With it, you can't be. You just can't be. You can't be a Jew in in Indonesia. Um, that doesn't mean you you aren't. There's many people who are other religions in Indonesia. They they call them. Um, one of my research 
uh, contacts what calls it a kate pay Muslim. He's a card Muslim. It, so he he just practices ancestral beliefs in, in home, um, and but on his card he identifies as as Muslim. So um, it happens a lot. There's a lot of really like strange connections there. Um, natural resources love this topic. Um, so some of my work was looking at mostly land rights within national parks. This is still contentious because you don't have national parks like we do here where you've kicked out everybody out of the parks. There are still many, many people that live within the national parks um, throughout Southeast Asia um, because unlike here where you had territories where we kicked out people or there were territories that maybe didn't have people on them. I don't want to go, they always have people, on them, but they kicked them out effectively. Um, but in Indonesia and a lot of the Southeast Asian countries, that wasn't possible. And so you have a lot of people living in national parks um, within Southeast Asia. And so it's a continual process of trying to figure out how to balance the, the rights of um, a population to their natural resources, whether that's to visit as an outsider or whether that's to use them as an indigenous person that has relied on these natural resources. Um, another thing I looked at is um, gold mining. So there's a lot of gold mining. Mercury use is not allowed. Um, it's been banned within Indonesia, um, but there's a huge black market from it. So I looked at the way that um, these communities would use the tailings from gold mining process. Uh, and then they would use mercury in order to buy, because it's not big chunks of gold, it's like very tiny flakes. And so they would use the mercury to bind together the gold molecules. Uh, and then they would, then they'll just burn it off and let it run off into the the, the rice patties. Um, and so there's a lot of cases of Minimata, which is a uh, mercury poisoning. And the reason it's is really, really difficult in Indonesia is because it's a long-term thing. It's You don't have these immediate effects from it. So you'll have birth defects in the next generation and this like lack of education about how this came to be. And so looking at some, kind of some of these health conditions as well that are linked to natural resources in, in Indonesia. Yep. Um, yes, I just have some factual questions about the Chinese population in Indonesia. Uh, first of all, roughly what percentage of the population is of Chinese extraction? Secondly, when did the Chinese immigrate into Indonesia and which provinces of China did they come from? Were they Fujianese or Hakan or, or whatever? And, and finally, did the Dutch employ some of them as tax farmers? Wow, these are all such good questions. And I'm not sure I have the answers to some of them. I don't want to pull a percentage out. Um, but there are some, it looks like some other Indonesian experts here that might have that information. Anybody up back there that wants to? Um, it's a smaller population. They are still um, very much feel like they are a bit persecuted within the country. Uh, there's a lot of studies. There's a lot of scholars that are working on this, the, the Chinese question within Indonesia. Um, you asked about when they came. They, um, I mean, it's not new. It's not. It's it's. They've been there for for generations and decades. Um, yeah, we. Um, one of the research sites we went into um, was in central Kalimantan, and the woman there who remembered bombers parachuting in to like during World War One into the Borneo jungle. She remembers this and she was like, come on, I'm going to show you something cool. And she takes me into her like section of the longhouse. And there's just like five or six of these huge rice, Chinese, like rice storage ceramic jars that, I mean, a couple of hundred years old that, and so they're huge, they're heavy, like how they got there, how, I mean, this, like, it's a very interconnected global um, trade system, and Indonesia is right on it because of their place right there through the Straits um, of Malacca, and so they have been tied in. Now, during the, um, one of the problems that they've had with this, these community is that uh, when Suharto had some of this stuff in the 1950s and 60s, he said, you have to decide. You have to decide if you want to be, a, we're not going to do dual citizenship. So you have to decide, are you Indonesian or are you Chinese? And so all of those people that chose to be Chinese 
and keep Chinese citizenship, um, even if their families had lived there for you know, many, many generations. Um, then Indonesia cut off diplomatic ties with Peking in, I think, like 1967 or something. And so all of those people became stateless because the Indonesian government viewed them as um, Chinese citizens and Chinese was like, no, or China was like, no, they're they're Indonesian citizens. And so now we have, I think it's like maybe 30,000 people or so that are stateless. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's very complicated in how it's all, yeah. So we're coming up on time, but I'm gonna ask one last question here. We had a question from somebody online and to get back at the natural resource question, I mean, for, you know, hundreds of years, Indonesia has been fighting for self-determination and control of its bounty. And, um, you know, in recent years, that's been, you know, palm oil and minerals and petroleum and all sorts of things. But for the last 10 years, um, it has been the world's largest mined and refined nickel producer. So I'm really curious, because this is of, of huge interest to a lot of the rest of the world. What does the election mean for the nickel production and the EV battery supply chain? This is really interesting. <laughs> I wish I had more um, uh, information on it because I would like to know as well. Um, I think we can continue to see um, exactly what's been happening through the decades within Indonesia, that it um, almost has this facade of being under the radar, but it is very much not under the radar. And I can guarantee that there are many political parties within many countries around the world that have are watching and are um, very much involved within these elections and trying to get somebody elected who is going to have their best interests in mind, which is some of that nickel mining and those exports. Um, I also, but, um, on the oil side, I have a um, honor student this quarter and her entire project is looking and comparing the difference between the outcomes for oil production within um, countries uh, she's comparing Indonesia and Nigeria and how those colonial histories have impacted um, the way that they currently. And so what she's finding actually is that Indonesia um, has had a lot of control over their oil industry, um, but over time they have not invested in the technology. And so they've reached kind of an impasse where they are, they don't have any more like very easy to find oil. And so they're coming to a stall where they either need to um, really invest in oil um, and technology in order to extract more and export that, or uh, it, that, that's going to kind of begin to decline in the coming decades. Yeah. Okay, let us give our visiting scholar a big hand. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, reminder to you all next week, pandemic preparation, preparedness with Chunwei Chi from uh, OSU. Um, fantastic speaker. He spoke for us uh, online for a great decision a couple years ago, and he was here for Diplomacy Begins Here, which we did up at the Forestry Center in, oh, good to Lord, uh, 2022. And um, so I hope to see you all here then, and um, have a safe week, and enjoy this lovely weather we're having.